Okay. Well, thank you. We're just trying to struggle a little bit through this technology, but what we're going to do for the next hour or so is go through some landlord tenant issues in terms of what the status of the court orders are right now, vis a vis evictions and foreclosures. And um, I want to also, we've been mostly looking at residential. Um, evictions and uh, residential foreclosures, but uh, it's come to light that there's similar issues existing in the commercial area as well. So we want to get uh, our bearings on what's going on now and what, if anything, the legislature can do. We have at least one person from the administration here. And I know that they're looking at this issue very closely as well several states have instituted moratoriums. So we're gonna try and collect information in the next hour and 15 minutes from various witnesses. And then probably next week we'll decide what if anything we're gonna do uh, further than the efforts that the court has been able to do. So uh, I, I'd like to start with um, Judge Grierson. You've testified before before our committee and you know there's been a subsequent uh, amendment to the administrative order and where we are now. And um, I know I wrote you and I, I am a little confused between the process of starting a fiction and a writ of possession. And once a writ of possession is on track, is there any way to slow that uh, down and how there could be some intervention. So if you don't mind in educating us a little bit, Judge Grierson, that would be great. Oh, there's Cheryl. Uh, so I will try and uh, thank the committee for allowing me to appear today and asking me to appear. The Supreme Court, although uh, they have issued uh, AO 49 and have also uh, amended that I think we're up to at least four amendments, possibly five as of this morning. None of those amendments would have a direct bearing on uh, eviction uh, proceedings. So in that sense, uh, the testimony I've given previously uh, remains the same. And that is um, the Supreme Court has not issued any directive um, I should put it that way. They have not imposed any stay on these proceedings. The trial judges have reviewed uh, their authority under the AO 49, and their position has been that eviction proceedings in and of themselves are not considered emergency hearings. So that if a new eviction is filed, uh, they are not taking any action on that to set, uh, for instance, a rest, rent escrow order. We're talking about a residential eviction now. Uh, that's usually the first step in the process. Uh, they are not scheduling those uh, unless uh, either a landlord or a tenant uh, seeks additional relief from the court, uh, asserting or alleging that there is an emergency situation that requires the court to act. So those, uh, to the extent those are filed, the court would consider those on an individual case-by-case -case basis. So there is no blanket order either by the Supreme Court or the trial bench uh, regarding all evictions. They will continue to handle them on a case-by-case -case basis. In any of the cases that are um, pending, if they have gone, if they prior to the pandemic, if they have gone to the next step, which is a rent escrow order, um, and the individual tenant stops paying rent under that order, uh, the landlord is entitled to seek a writ of possession uh, for the premises uh, if the rent is not paid. And those orders presently uh, under the current statutory framework uh, can be issued without the necessity of a hearing being held. And I think that's what I had addressed in my earlier testimony. And I believe in response to the written request, Senator Srock, and that um, 
I was just going to try to track that down. Let me see if I can find that. Well, while you're doing that, uh, let me ask a question. I fully understand the court's position that uh, if we were going to do any, if there were to be any moratorium on these kinds of proceedings, uh, that should come from either the executive branch or the legislature. Yes. Um, however, it seems like the court has taken a position that uh, would result in, other than in emergency situations, evictions are being stayed. Stayed. So I was curious as to why that can't be pushed up one level to this ministerial act of a uh, writ of possession um, to say that uh, if execution of a writ of possession, writ, execution of a writ of possession could take place, but only on an emergency basis and after a hearing, which hearings would be allowed if, a, if an emergency was uh, suggested. So I want to make sure I understand your question. You're asking me if if we get to the writ of possession stage, that there could be a hearing. Right. I'm wondering why I un, I honor and respect that you're keeping a distance from the policy, and the way you've done it so far is, or the court, ha, uh, the administrative order has done it so far, is generically saying that unless there's a or the trial judges have said, unless there's an emergency, we're not going to take up eviction proceedings. And I'm just trying to understand why that philosophy couldn't be bumped up one level to rid of possession. Um, the best answer I can give you, Senator, is that uh, the way the statute currently reads um, that the writ of possession is something that's already in place and it's just issued without the necessity of hearing. So as we look at the scope of our authority under AO 49, um, that at least at this point is not considered an emergency. Okay. I, I'm not sure. If, so I want to, I want to make sure I'm answering your question. That's I guess the follow-up question would be, under AO 49, you're saying a writ of possession is not considered an emergency. Um, it's not considered an emergency, um, and so, but no one has to ask for a hearing, and that's why. Uh, right, but so you're you're saying that. I mean, it's it's sort of a. What I'm suggesting is somewhat of a middle ground between a moratorium that I guess could be passed by statute by us or ordered somehow by the executive branch. This is sort of a middle ground where it says, you know, there may be individual cases and trusting the judges and the judiciary to sort that through that warrant the writ of possession to go through and served and, and enforced. Uh, but if there was a, if we could have the ability for the, for the litigants to ask or need to ask for a hearing to get that to happen, that there's an emergency on either side that would require the writ of possession to go forward. Um, then we wouldn't be shutting down all evictions, but we give people an ability to continue to argue their case given the given the virus. Um, some of these written possessions were in process before the virus came upon us. So it seems like the same kind of rationale you're you're, impl uh, uh, you're Im imposing for new cases that are starting. Um, failing to understand why you couldn't do that same thing for cases that are in the pipeline. Yeah, I'm just, um, I, I understand the, the question. The problem is that the, the, the Supreme Court, as I've said, has not weighed in on a, on a blanket 
or stay proceeding so that um, the decision would be left up to the individual uh, judges, um, whether it's on the, whether or not they determine that as a result of a filing and eviction, there are issues that create the emergency that allow them to have a hearing, um, or if someone were to um, bring the issue of the writ of possession to the attention of the court on an emergency basis, then under the AO 49, they could consider it that way. But the trial bench is not in a position to issue a, 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 a blanket uh, position on these okay, without so guidance from the court. I, I appreciate that. So you're, you, so I guess what I was looking for is already possible that somebody who has a crisis situation that is already subject to a, uh, a writ of possession could go into court and get an emergency hearing to have that writ of possession stayed. That's what I've said. Let me, let me read, I, I did find the earlier response I gave you and hopefully it'll give the committee some further direction as to where we're headed. Okay. After meeting and discussing this issue with the trial judges, there is a consensus, and I use the term consensus because there are 34 trial judges independently appointed, and they are able to exercise their own discretion. The consensus means we just didn't hear from everyone. But the, as a result of the limitations brought about by AO 49, they would alter their procedure. This is in relation specifically to writs of possession in the following manner. In response to any motion for a default judgment, a writ of possession, or other relief that include the issuance of a writ of possession, the court will schedule those hearings after April 15th. They may be continued, that's the, that's the deadline of AO 49. So essentially they would not be um, holding those hearings or something that would trigger the writ of possession until after April 15th. I think that gives some um, relaxation of the current rule, but maybe not as far as uh, other individuals would want to go. In the interim, a request for emergency relief filed by either landlords or tenants may be filed seeking more immediate relief. Motions would be handled, as I said earlier, on a case-by-case -case basis. There is also a provision if the trial judge does not feel that it's a, an emergency, uh, they can refer it to me and I determine not the merits of the proceeding, but whether or not to um, conduct the hearing. Sir and I apologize. This is Faith Brown speaking. I'm the moderator on the call. Uh, could we ask people to mute their phones if they're not on and or their speakers on their computers if they're not on? And any people that came in that have phone numbers, we'd like to identify who is on the call. So um, if we could just pause a moment to find out who five, the 3450 number is and the 6018. I apologize. 3450 uh, three, is Wendy Morgan. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. 6018 is Jamie Fian. Faith. Thank you. So, and, and for those of us who are not lawyers, the writ of possession is, 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 the, the point at which a tenant is informed of a decision? No, the well, can no, you the just tell us quickly what that is? Because you're using a term that is, I'm beginning to understand it in the discussion, but it would be helpful for those of us who aren't lawyers to understand that. If the rent isn't paid according to the rent escrow order, the writ of possession can issue that allows the person to be dispossessed from, the, from their from their. Uh, apartment. In other words, it gives the court, the, the sheriff, the authority to issue the writ saying possession of the property now belongs to the landlord. Thank it's, you. It, it's, the, it's the ultimate relief in an eviction proceeding. In other words, it, it removes the, the landlord. Removes the tenant from the property. Thank you. So, uh, Senator Srokin, I that is that is the uh, sense from the trial bench that if these matters come in, uh, 
other relief that include the issuance of the writ of possession uh, or seeking writ of possession, the court will hold hearings after the date of this, um, of the AO 49 order. Okay, so the, the, the point in time that I am and other people are concerned with are whether a um, someone who's in violation of a back rent order has already reduced that order to a writ of possession that's in the sheriff's hands or on its way. Um, we've had an intervening event here of COVID-19 and there may be new factors that would justify slowing that process down just as there are factors that are justifying slowing the beginning of the process down. So I understand that somebody might have an opportunity even in this late stage to go ask for a hearing and say i'm going to be homeless and spread the disease um but how how would they know that they would have that opportunity to go to a judge a trial judge and say uh this writ of possession is happening now and I have some circumstances here that it's not good for anybody to kick me out or whatever, uh, evict me. Uh, is there a way we can somehow or require a act of the legislature to at least get notice out to these folks um, directing uh, the sheriffs before they serve the writ of possession to say, to give some sort of notice to say, if you feel you have a, a circumstances here, you could always apply on an emergency basis to a superior court judge. I mean, obviously that's something that the, the committee has to consider how to get that type of notice out. Um, keeping in mind that a large majority of the individuals we're talking about are uh, self-represented litigants. So uh, they are a population that um, for the most part does not have access to um, attorneys um, in, in many of the, of the uh, counties um, through legal aid or local bar associations. They do provide limited representation at the beginning of, of a hearing. In other words, at the rent escrow stage at the very beginning, uh, we have some programs that provide them with legal counsel, but only for that um, limited hearing, which often results in an agreement to pay rent and pay rent into court. Um, but once that order is in effect, um, my understanding is that the legal representation for the most part ends with that hearing and um, the attorneys may not continue to be involved in the representation at a point when a writ of possession uh, could be ordered. So I'm not sure how that word would get out uh, to individuals unless at the very beginning of the case, they're given that advice if they have the benefit of counsel. Um, okay, so essentially what you're saying is there's, um, because the courts do not want to get involved in this policy decision there is nothing more that we can expect forthcoming from the courts in terms of notice or slowing these writs of possession down uh, you know the legis i guess the executive branch could do this fairly clean and swiftly if they wanted to and i know they're looking at it the legislative process tends to be a little more clunky uh, so I'm just trying to see what our options are. So am I correct in saying that uh, at least in from where you sit, you don't see the court able to do anything more in this area other than what you've already done? 
The short answer to that, Senator, would be yes, but let me qualify it a little bit. Um, th these are essentially policy decisions, which, as you know, um, the court and I certainly don't get involved in um, when I'm testifying. Um, and although I'm appearing for the for the judiciary, uh, there are levels of authority um, in the court process, and if the Supreme Court has not uh, and has not uh, taken that uh, position to impose a stay in these proceedings. And I think you understand from my prior testimony that they do not view that as something they can do. It, they view that as a, a executive or legislative decision. So you go to the next level of authority. And although in my role as chief superior judge, um, I have some um, authority, if you will, over the trial bench. Uh, we have to keep in mind that they are, as I've indicated, independently appointed uh, judges who exercise their individual discretion. And I'm not in a position to issue a blanket um, uh, order as to how they should handle these cases. And that's why at this point, um, it is handled on a on a case by case individual basis. And um, I, at this point, I would have to say I don't see anything changing. But I will tell you that um, the court, Supreme Court, meets almost daily um, with themselves and um, and with the the trial bench. Um, so these these are not discussions that are closed. We continue to talk about these issues, um, and we'll continue to do so. Um, so let me just wrap up, Judge Grierson. I, I very much appreciate your testimony. You've been very clear. I guess from a lay perspective, I would say I, I, I find some inconsistency in the fact that the Supreme Court has effectively stayed uh, these eviction proceedings in their initial stages, but has not stayed them to the extent they're, and I assume that the original thing was stayed because of the virus and resources and, and things like that to protect people and others. Uh, but cases that are a little bit further down the line, they have not stayed. So I'd find something consistent there. And I, I believe I, I'm a big fan of the courts, as you know, and individual judges making decisions. But my suggestion, and maybe you can bring it to the court, is that it's not a blanket stay. It's a, there's still the, there's still be the ability for people to go to court to lift the, the whole uh, the suspension of executions of the writs of possession. So it could be a case by case basis. It's not a moratorium on any evictions. Some could go forward and, but, it would be um, the the default position would be that they would be stayed just like you're doing for new evictions. So emergencies. Yeah, let me just clarify one part of what you said. The, the Supreme Court has not imposed a stay of any kind. What they have said is, in particular with respect to landlord tenant matters, AO forty nine sets forth that all proceedings are suspended except emergency proceedings. And then they give a list of what those proceedings are. Included in that list is emergency landlord tenant hearings in the discretion of the judge, meaning the trial judge. So there is no stay on eviction proceedings. Trial judges are interpreting AO 49 and that clause to be that an eviction proceeding filed, if one is filed today, um, the court, the trial court, will not take that up, not because it's there's a stay imposed, but they will not take it up because they do not view it as an emergency proceeding that they have to take up under this AO 49. Right. I understand that. I'm, I'm using the word stay loosely that's all yeah I, I understand and i think i've been guilty of that probably myself okay um, i guess i have one last question uh how does our discussion fit in with 
commercial landlord tenant um, relationships like restaurants that are leasing property and have now been shut down? This is, a, this is a big issue with the other parts of our jurisdiction. A lot of our businesses, this is a big, a big concern for many restaurants. No, I, I understand. And I, I, my answer in many respects would be the same, um, Senator Sorokin and, and, and Senator Clarkson, because uh, the reason, I mean, the court is a neutral party. Um, right. And therefore, the, the approach they take on these cases is not uh, one that favors landlords or tenants, whether it's in a commercial setting or a residential setting. Um, and that's why that's the, um, I just wanted to make sure that AO 49, when they say, leave it to the judge to determine whether it's an emergency or not, that applies to both commercial landlord tenant and residential landlord tenant. And, and the way I'm reading it, and this would be my interpretation when it says emergency landlord tenant, I, I read that broadly. Uh, there's nothing in here that otherwise says, this is how we're gonna handle residential uh, eviction. This is how we're going to handle commercial proceedings. I view that as landlord tenant, whether you're uh, commercial or residential, if, if that became an issue, and I'm not aware that it has been, uh, I mean, I certainly haven't heard about it, then we, we could go back to the court, Supreme Court for clarification. But I view um, landlord tenant in the context of AO 49 as either commercial or residential. And, and Judge Greer, Michael, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, Judge Greer said, how, just to give those of us who don't deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, a notion of how far along in a rental dispute, how far along in that proceeding would it even get to court? I mean, we're dealing hopefully with a matter of two or three months, ideally. If there are rental issues now uh, that have just cropped up as a result of COVID-19, what's your what's the timing? I mean, how how far along in a proceeding is it when it actually goes gets to court? Well, if the issues arise today, obviously we don't control when they come into court. So if you're saying that the issues arise today and someone files an action today under AO 49. Uh, the trial judges do not view that as an emergency that would require any action at this point. Right. And I get I get that. I get that. Okay. The question is, from the beginning of a rental problem, how many months, and maybe Wendy could answer this or somebody else, uh, it, it, I just would love, I think all of us would love a sense of, the, of how long it takes to actually get to court. But when you say get to court, you're talking about getting to a final hearing. Is that what you're asking? Because... On a, on a landlord tenant, the, the traditional residential setting, the issues generally speaking are not that complicated. A commercial landlord tenant dispute could have significant issues that take you know months, if not longer to resolve. but yeah, but a, a residential proceeding, we have normally that quick hearing right away uh, on the issue of paying rent into court. And that obviously speeds up the process in terms of how long the, the tenant can continue to pay rent before this writ of possession may issue. But those are the hearings that we are not scheduling. Right, so, no, um, I, I, okay. I understand. I'm just trying to get a sense of timing with rent. Let me maybe, just... maybe we can ask Wendy that question. Uh, Judge, I really appreciate your time Michael, once again. And... Um, we may take this up again next week. I don't know if we'll uh, have to hear, hear from you yet again. I think we've, we've got a good picture of things where they stand right now from the judiciary's perspective. So thank you very much. And Michael, may um, I ask a question? Yes. Um, I'm frankly, I'm encouraged by what I've heard from Judge Grierson today that judges are making decisions as opposed to following a, a, a blanket rule of one kind or another. Uh, you recognize, I think, and we should, that we want to protect people who are financially imperiled because of the COVID-19 situation on the one hand, but on the other hand, we recognize that landlords are people too, 
and that particularly our small landlords are faced with some of these same financial issues. We need to have balance, and I believe that that balance ought to come from judiciary uh, unless and until we do something in the legislature, and that's something, whether it be uh, providing some, some set of circumstances under which an eviction can, in fact, be stayed, I'm not sure that we're ready to do that or need to do that at this point, since it seems that we've accomplished what we what we're seeking to do based on the way the judiciary is currently handling it. But the thing that I want to emphasize is I think the judiciary should be the one on a case by case basis who handles these things and not us. Thank you. Um, OK, Judge, do you have anything more you'd like to say? I don't, Senator. I understand that, uh, you know, circumstances uh, are changing daily, sometimes hourly, certainly on our end. And if uh, other uh, information comes my way, I'll provide it to the committee. I'm available uh, if you continue to have hearings um, to participate. And uh, I'm Thank glad to make so myself much. available. Thank you so much. So I want to move to uh, Wendy Morgan. Um, could you, I know, Wendy, are you there? I am here. Okay, are you going to be testifying today, this morning? No, I think you are all going to learn more from Jean Murray, who is an attorney who handles these cases on the ground, and she can answer some of the questions that you have um, been asking. Um, that would be my recommendation. Also, we're trying to cover House General at the same time. Is she on the line right now? I believe so. Can we hear from her? Jean, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Barely. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Can you speak up yeah. a little bit. Um, this is Jean Murray. I'm a, an attorney at Vermont Legal Aid. Um, I'm sorry I joined your call just a little bit late. I don't, um, I don't know what question you was before the committee, um, but I would like to take the opportunity to talk about a legislative um, legislation that would uh, stay all of the eviction and foreclosure actions um, that get filed in the courts for the period of time that is the um, state of emergency and for 60 days after. Um, there is language being considered in House General that we were talking about this morning. Um, I don't know if this committee has that language in front of them. No. No. Um, well, instead of talking so, about the language per se, unless you feel a, a need to do that, um, we'd like to just understand what the lay of the land is out there and who is in your in your uh, opinion, your clients are presently at risk. And, um, I don't know if you heard the back and forth that I had with Judge Grierson, but one thought short of a, a moratorium on evictions was somehow to, to get noted, uh, further notice to people who may be subject to a writ of possession that they do have the right to go ask for an emergency hearing and stay the eviction on a case by case basis at that point. So this is this is what I I think and why we would ask for a stay of all writs that have already been issued and um, ask uh, that the court suspend issuing any new writs is because case by case basis means that people will have to get up out of their house and figure out how to get documents into the court and um, perhaps go for a hearing in the court, although some hearings are held by phone. Um, having to adjudicate something in a court right now is incredibly difficult for my client group, which is low income people, because um, just think about how difficult it is for us to communicate with each other 
and we have phones and we have conference lines and we have computers, all of which my clients don't have. So um, what, and just a little bit of background and the way I think about it is in the usual course of business, there are about 1800 evictions filed a year. In state fiscal year 19, there were about 1800 evictions filed. That's 150 a month. That's in the usual course of business. Um, and evictions are filed for more than one reason. Evictions are filed um, certainly for non-payment, um, but they are also filed for no cause, um, meaning that the landlord wants to resume possession of the property, sometimes to renovate it, sometimes to move back in themselves. And then there are evic evictions for cause where a uh, tenant um, just may not be a good fit for the building. I, I know I'm downplaying that, but sometimes uh, there are reasons um, that uh, landlords want the apartment back. For all of those reasons, right now, during a public health crisis, there should be no evictions. And because in Vermont, all evictions uh, go through the court, there is no self-help eviction, there is no landlord calls the sheriff, all evictions have to go through the court. So the court um, making a, a temporary legislation about staying all evictions and foreclosures is the way to stop people from being involuntarily removed from their homes during a public health crisis. There, there isn't a, can't we have this exception and that exception? Because everybody should stay home during a public health crisis. And so in terms of the lay of the land, if it were the usual course of business, some, you know, the courts would be processing 150 evictions a month. Those are the ones that get filed. Right now, and for the state of emergency, and while there's a public health crisis, none should be processed. Everybody should just stay put, just put a pause on the whole thing. And then um, what we have thought about is once the state of emergency is lifted, have a 60 day period after where everything is still paused to work everything out. Um, there's other legislation, there may be federal assistance coming for rental assistance money, um, for more money for services for hard to house tenants. And uh, it could, we could use the period of time the couple months after the state of emergency is lifted to get everybody sorted out and housed appropriate to what they should be. Some landlords would be happy to keep tenants if the tenants can keep up with rent payments. Um, people will be, be able to find a place to move um, for those who can find a place to move. Right now, no one can find a place to move. I have clients in my caseload who had agreed to move. They can't find apartments because nobody is meeting them at an apartment and showing an apartment because everybody has to stay home. So um, as I say, there is language been, legislative language been drafted in a bill that is before House General that describes the details of what, um, exactly what cases should be stayed um, in court. Um, and another thing that I want to mention is litigation about um, eviction and foreclosure uh, requires sheriffs and constables at certain points of time to go out and do what's called service in hand. During a public health crisis, service in hand does not sound like a good idea. So, um, Nothing in hand sounds good. So the idea would be to um, not require service in hand to start a case um, that that 
a case could be started by filing and then postpone the deadline for getting service accomplished until after the state of emergency. Um, just so we're doing what we can to keep people apart. So let me ask you a, a, a question. Is there any way to know or approximate the amount of um, eviction, residential eviction procedures that are, um, I know Judge Grierson doesn't wanna refer to um, what the Supreme Court has done as a stay, but I think it's pretty much effectively a stay at least till April 15th on new evictions. How many are past the period where there's no more need for any kind of judicial intervention. And I think you said 150 a month is what have been filed, but do we have any idea how many are out there in the state of Vermont that haven't been executed on? Huh. Well, no, we don't know. Um, one way to, there's other people at Vermont Legal Aid who are trying to figure out that information right now um, because there are people who would be willing to count through um, docket entries to figure out what is currently pending, but that would mean um, the judiciary would have to share a massive amount of information with us so we can comb through it and figure it out. But there is really, there's not like a ticker. <laughs> there's no data that somebody keeps on a day-to-day -day basis. It would have to be um, literally combed through by hand to figure out where all the cases are. Okay. Um, and, you, and you said um, you said something about uh, the new federal law providing rental assistance. I, I had read somewhere even before it was passed yesterday that it sounded at least in terms of housing and homelessness monies, it seemed like. Vermont might get a nice share of the pie there. And I ask this question in, in, in the sense of if there was some relief forthcoming, whether it's to pay the back rent or to shelter somebody after they got evicted, um, it may make the problem uh, um, lesser in the term of duration in terms of like if we did a moratorium it sounds like you're potentially asking for let's say the declaration is is uh, last for three months and then you have 60 days after you're asking for a five month stay and we might find ourselves in in that period of time with um new resources to deal with this problem in a slightly different fashion. I believe that's true. Um, I'm not the person to talk about um, the more exact sources of federal funding. And my understanding is um, that the numbers of what federal funding is coming for rental assistance, et cetera, those numbers are not definite yet. Um, so I believe Earhart is on the call and he could probably talk about how much money is coming and, and, or the, the state of understanding about how much money is coming. But yes, the idea is using assistance, um, get everybody's housing issues sorted out and try as much as possible to make, uh, essentially landlords whole for the time that they've had, would have to wait through the state of emergency. Okay. Um, do you have more you would like to add? Because we're running late at this time. We'll probably be taking this up uh, next week again. But um, if you had some more thoughts, we'd welcome them now. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next witness. If um, I can send... Um, what I've said uh, to, I can email it to you in uh, written testimony. I made some
some this morning. Um, and uh, if there's no questions of me, I'm okay. good to go. That would be great to send that in. Does anybody have any questions for Jean? Michael, can, can we get the language from the House bill? Yes, I'm sure we can. Uh, I have a question. Jean, uh, it's Allison Clarkson. <clears throat> do, do you, could you give us a sense of, of um, the, the timing on an, an, an eviction for a business or, you know, for a commercial or for a residential? I mean, how long does it rise? How long does it take to rise to the level of court action? I mean, um, I can only speak to residential eviction. So the, the landlord tenant law, the Residential Rental Agreements Act, if you want to look at it, it's at 9 VSA 4451, I hope, um, has different uh, periods of time that are required to terminate tenancy. So termination of tenancy is a written letter sent by the landlord to a tenant um, prior to the tenancy being that terminates tenancy. It's an official thing. So if it's a non-payment of rent case, the, the time that uh, the notice has to be is 14 days. If it is a for cause eviction, it has to be 30 days. And if it is a no cause eviction, um, it has to be somewhere between 60 and 90 days, depending on what the, if there's a written rental agreement and depending on how long the tenant has lived there. So that period of time has to pass before a case can be filed. And once that period of time has passed, then the landlord can file a case. Um, and that would be one thing that the legislation that we propose would preserve the landlord's right if they have already sent a notice um, of termination and the time has passed, they can go ahead and file and then everything just stays in that status um, it, while the state of emergency happens and then they can pick up uh, where they left off and wouldn't have to start over. Um, and then once something gets filed in court, uh, it depends on a, a number of things. There could be, if there's non-payment of rent, there could be a preliminary hearing that happens generally within three or four weeks to order uh, payment of rent into court. But for cases where the rent is currently being paid, um, my sense is the first time people usually get into court is around 30 to 45 days when the court sets a status conference and then anywhere from 45 to 60 days later, they may set a merits hearing. The reason it takes uh, that period of time is because the court encourages parties to um, do discovery, um, to have negotiations, to try to resolve the cases themselves. So generally, by the, from the time a case gets filed, and, um, uh, I believe Angela Zykowski from the Tenants Association, I mean, the Landlords Association is on and she'll correct me, but from the time a case gets filed until the court makes a judgment of eviction, um, it could be anywhere from two to six months. Thanks. That's helpful just as we look at the arc of this crisis. Okay, Thanks. so um, thank you, Jean. Uh, one, I guess one, um, Last question, do you guys represent folks in foreclosures as well? Um, not, at, not at this time. I don't think we're actively representing people in foreclosure, but certainly um, Legal Aid and Legal Services Vermont, when people call having received foreclosure process, we give them um, a lot of information and advice. Um, so we have in the past, uh, done foreclosure representation. We ran out of resources to do that. Um, but when people call, we still give them information and people can find information about how to defend themselves and what steps they can take on our website, okay. which is 
btlawhelp.org. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to move on to um, Angela or Chris, unless you think you have different things to say, I'd rather you decide among the two of you what you're going to say. And I'd prefer it be J Angela because I can't stand looking at that view behind Chris. It's really <laughs> unfair. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Yeah, Angela will handle this for us. Okay. So Angela, if you can talk in general or, um, I mean, I assume you've seen the, the bill that we've just been sent um, and are dealing with in the house and what are your general thoughts, if you could give that to us? Sure, thank you for allowing me to come testify uh, regarding the situation. My name's Angela Zykowski. I'm the director of the Vermont Landlords Association. I'm also a practicing attorney, and the primary focus of my practice is representing landlords throughout the state of Vermont. Um, so I have been in communication with uh, many folks around the state, and I will say the primary concern um, for landlords right now is their rent payments and whether they are going to receive those rent payments or not or how that is going to look and work. Um, I know the uh, bill that every house bill that everybody's been talking about has a pretty substantial, uh, I know it's a placeholder allocation, but a pretty substantial allocation uh, that would allow tenants um, and presumably landlords, depending on how it ultimately is crafted, to uh, request funds to have rent paid uh, while this uh, crisis continues. Um, and for, you know, landlords are, need many times that money to pay their mortgage, to pay their taxes, to pay uh, the carrying costs, the maintenance, um, and any, you know, emergency repairs to, to buildings. Um, and so that's a critical component here. Um, I, I will say that the legal aid uh, proposal that is in that bill uh, is actually quite fair um, to all of the parties. It uh, sort of breaks out by category um, various points in which uh, an eviction could be at any given time. Um, I do have some uh, specific feedback on some sections that I am working on crafting and can uh, circulate that as well, um, just related to some specifics. But I think overall the sentiment of the bill uh, is incredibly important. You know, with the governor's stay home, stay safe order, uh, we can't have people being moved out of their housing right now, but we need to find a mechanism so landlords are protected, so tenants are protected, and we have some balance for both sides. Okay, and what is the balance for the landlords as you see it in that bill, um, given that it sounds like there is a, there would be a significant stay on any evictions going forward at this point? Well, the balance um, for the bill for the landlords is sort of twofold. One, it doesn't relieve tenants of their obligation to pay the rent. So the, the bill is very clear in that regard. Um, the balance also comes with the funds that would be made available uh, to tenants and landlords to help with this rent arrearage or rent arrearage issues. Um, it also doesn't prevent landlords from sending termination notices or filing cases. So landlords can still take advantage of those processes. It just, once it hits the courthouse, it stops. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like your position is, is that you recognize the public health crisis here and you want to uh, do right by the tenants and the community and not spreading the disease, but you also need some assurances that you're going to get paid. Correct. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. That's helpful. Uh, do you have anything else you'd like to add, Angela? No, I think um, I think this is a difficult issue and sort of unprecedented that any of us have ever dealt with or seen, uh, and it's challenging. And there's a lot of issues and there's greater issues at play um, here with public public health and safety. Michael, could I ask a question, please? Angela, uh, 
are you then saying that there is a need for us to go through with legislation as opposed to just uh, letting the court take care of this with their ruling? I, I think what would be incredibly helpful is to have a uh, systemized and uniform approach. Um, I appreciate uh, the, the judiciary's uh, administrative orders, and I appreciate what they are attempting to do. They do have lots of other cases that they deal with, um, but sort of a piecemeal approach, county by county, and judge by judge doesn't necessarily help us in this situation. I mean, we need a statewide, this is, what the, this is what the rules are, this is what everybody needs to do, so we have consistency. And is your association talking with the administration about implementing this? Um, we, well, this bill is brand new. Um, the most recent draft was only available at 9 a.m. this morning, um, but my association and I have been in communication with uh, members of the associate or with members of the administration about housing related issues. Thank you. Members of the administration, you said? Yes, um, specifically um, housing and economic development. Okay, well, we have Josh Hans. Josh is on the phone. Um, okay, well, I appreciate your time. And we're going to move on with a, a few more witnesses that I'd like to get in in the next. 20 minutes. I may jump around a little bit here. Um, Mayor Weinberger has joined us, uh, and I know he has a, a particular concern, I think, that may have a little bit to do with local control, so I'd like to hear from him next. Uh, Mayor, are you there? I am, Senator Sorokin. Good. So we've been talking about the pros and cons of a moratorium. Uh, some hybrids of that. Uh, I think you might have a slightly different uh, local take on what you might want the legislature to do. So I'd like to let you express that to the committee now. Um, well, great. Thank you for including me. Um, uh, these are unusual and remarkable times. Um, and so uh, we're all moving quickly. Um, and, so, Senator, what I was mostly prepared to speak to was a related issue, a little bit longer term. Like, I, I, I hope you do ever whatever needs to be done to ensure that evictions just cannot go forward um, in the immediate term while we figure out uh, this new reality. Uh, I, I just think this is absolutely the wrong time for anyone to be being evicted for non-payment given the public health uh, crisis that we're facing and the fact that people need shelter and need to be staying at home. They are in fact ordered to stay at home. Um, we don't believe the city has the ability in our municipality to stop such evictions or it's not clear to us how we do so. We've set up a resource center so that anyone who is imminently facing eviction, we've asked them to contact us and we would help them on an individualized basis. We haven't gotten any such calls so far, I don't believe. Um, but uh, we don't think we have the legal ability to to actually stop uh, ev evictions for non-payment. So we are looking to the state to do that in some way. I can't advise you on the best way to do it. I do have some other thoughts about that look out a little bit longer term to um, uh, June and then August. On and if you that would be helpful at this time, I can kind of bring you into what we're thinking about on a little bit longer time frame. Uh, well, we're short for time, but if you could. Do that in five minutes, that would be great. Great, um, here's what we're thinking. We think that our um, constituents have been hit very hard. Many of our constituents, maybe a majority of our constituents have been hit very hard by this economic crisis. And we would like to take bold action as a municipality to, um, to assist them. Am I still, you guys can still hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, S sorry. Um, the actions that we are considering is basically saying to any person that owes us property taxes in June, on June 12th, we are thinking about saying to them, if you will sign an affidavit claiming, uh, uh, assert, you know, stipulating that you have been um, impacted by the COVID-19 emergency, we will give you a deferral without any interest or penalty until August 12th to make your property tax payment. Um, 
and this is coming back to the runner issue in a moment, but let me just lay this out. Uh, further, we're looking out a little bit further, and, and I say this, this is real time. I'm giving this to you. We have not completed our financial analysis. I'm not convinced we will be able to do this as a municipality, but we're trying to do this. We, would, we then are looking at the August payment. We think some people are going to be in no position to make a double payment in August as a result of, of this emergency. And so at that point, we would work out with them a payment plan um, where they could pay off over some number of years, and we haven't set the years yet, um, these two tax payments. Um, and the way we would fund such action would be to go into the credit markets right now, where my understanding is money can be borrowed very inexpensively. And we would borrow um, millions of dollars, maybe tens of millions of dollars in order to, to fund these payment plans. We would, in the August payment, I envision we would require some documentation that would be means tested, if you will, at some level, because people would have to show us that they actually, you know, document that they had been hit by this. Um, we would, um, uh, Pat, we would need to charge, I think, as a city for these essentially multi-year loans at that point, but we would do so on a very low, we would pass along our low interest, um, uh, borrowing, we would you know, we wouldn't try to make any money as a municipality on this. So we think we could get much lower um, loan rates than constituents would be able to um, otherwise get on their own and like likelihood. And so it could be valuable to them in that way. And then the final key piece of this that we're working out is I think we would make it clear to any property owner that had a tenant, whether it's a residential tenant or a commercial tenant, a small business, if they want to take advantage of this city program, these deferrals and payment plan, they would have to make a binding commitment to us that they could not evict a tenant for, for non-payment um, uh, during until the city was made whole. Um, lots of details to be filled in there, but that's basically what we're thinking, and I'm optimistic about it. It seems to me like it, it should work, given the city's uh, authority, powers to um, ultimately ensure that we will be able to get payment because we have um, significant proper, you know, rights as uh, we, we get paid before any other creditor. So we, we think we could do this pretty safely without putting um, other property taxpayers at risk. And I say all this to you um, so that you're aware we're thinking about it, but I also, we, it would be an even more valuable and meaningful um, benefit to people uh, if we could do the same with the uh, state's ed fund portion of the property tax. I think it could similarly be done on very safe, low cost, low risk basis. But I think the city would, we couldn't do that without, as I understand the legalities, I don't think it would be legal or, or appropriate or feasible for us to do that without state agreement. But I guess I did want to say if this was something that the legislature wanted to consider doing together or doing on a statewide basis, we'd be very interested in those conversations. So thank you very much for that. And your beginning comments were appreciated as well. Um, so until you got to the end, I was assuming that the Ed Fund portion would be borrowed and paid for by the city as well. Um, is that something you is that a financial complication? It obviously is more challenging, but do you see a legal problem as long as somebody pays the Ed Fund what, what they're due? Um, uh, that, so my concern there is just about, um, at some point we would probably start to run into limits of what the credit markets would be willing to lend to us if right. it was, you know, we're talking about a lot of money. If, you know, if it's just the municipal side, right. um, it, you know, it, it's more than twice. It, it would, it would trip. <clears throat> we would be borrowing three times as much right. um, if we were borrowing for the education side as well. I'm not sure we're going to be able to do that, but, um, but uh, I also think there could be, I think we have obligations. I, I don't understand all the legal obligations fully right. yet either. I think we have obligations to make payments to the state, regardless of whether we've received the payments at a certain point. And so how that all works out would require additional work. Right. 
So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Can you keep us in the loop on your thinking? Uh, because maybe we can spread that idea around the state. I know in our finance committee, we're looking, you know, we're looking at all different elements of people's debts and property taxes, one that we just talked about yesterday. So this is a pretty creative idea and we'd like to keep abreast of what you're doing. Yeah. Excellent. Well, well each municipality is beginning to be in, you know, everybody's beginning to be in touch about this big issue and everybody sadly has a different payment schedule, but it, it, you're, Miro, you're spot on. This is a, the next huge issue other than income that people are, are facing financially. So I'm gonna let Excellent. you sign off and thank you for coming. Okay, thanks Bye for including me. Bye from Winter <laughs> County. Um, yes, I send my best to all of you down there. Bye-bye. So uh, is Michael Pichak on the phone? Okay. Hi, Senator, I am. Oh, you are, okay. Um, I was not entirely sure uh, whether we invited you or you had <laughs> something to talk about vis-a-vis -vis this issue, whether it be foreclosures or uh, evictions or forbearance, uh, but I always welcome the opportunity to hear from you, Michael. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate that. I um, welcome the opportunity to speak uh, to the committee. So maybe I'll just be brief and and talk about uh, the perspective from uh, from DFR's viewpoint. So we um, at DFR, along with our federal counterparts, uh, did issue guidance um, uh, probably a week and a half ago now to our member institutions, our banks, and our credit unions, um, providing them flexibility uh, to defer loans to. Um, uh, you know, uh, have scheduled missed payments uh, to waive fees um, and all of the flexibility that they need to serve their communities uh, without any regulatory consequence. Um, we also encourage them to be flexible to um, obviously all industries, but in particular, the industries that were hit the hardest uh, by the COVID-19 um, pandemic, obviously, uh, you know what those uh, industries are. So we have seen our, our banking um, uh, and credit union institutions respond. I mean, we have uh, seen that response in terms of flexibility for current clients and members. We've seen a number of um, institutions respond with uh, new um, loan options also for uh, new clients or new members. Um, so that um, is certainly encouraging. That, as it equates to this issue, certainly gives residential mortgage holders more flexibility. Um, it certainly gives landlords uh, more flexibility. Um, and then, uh, you know, hopefully they are passing that flexibility down to their tenants um, as well. But certainly on the mortgage piece, um, there is uh, a willingness on our lenders and our mortgage servicers too, if, you know, beyond just the Vermont banks uh, to provide um, flexibility. Another thing that we're doing is analyzing the federal uh, actions to date. So there has been a moratorium on uh, foreclosures uh, for loans that relate to Fannie or Freddie Mac. Those uh, we understand are at least 60% of the market nationally, probably at least 50% of the market in Vermont. So there's already a moratorium on foreclosures. I understand the federal stimulus bill will expand that uh, to um, include evictions as well for a hundred, or I think it's a 90 day time period. So we wanna get a better sense of what's happening um, at the federal level uh, from that standpoint. And then also Excuse what type what, of stimulus. Michael, what you, yeah. did you say there was a 90 day stay on evictions? Uh, if you are, if you're, if the loans, if somebody has a loan relating to, so if a landlord has a loan relating to Fetty, Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae or various other federal um, loan, um, uh, loan. By those entities, okay. Yeah, so it's not sort of a moratorium broadly, but basically if you are, have your loan with any of those entities, you know, you get, I think certain for, you get certain flexibility so long as you don't um, evict. So, you know, that's something that we want to understand more clearly um, as well. And then, uh, I guess, as we view this, oh, sorry, one other point on the federal action. So the federal stimulus will also have, um, you know, obviously direct money into people's hands, uh, potentially, but also some um, loan forgiveness around um, rent and, uh, and um, landlord uh, uh, payments. 
uh, and, and costs that they might occur related to COVID-19. So we want to get a better understanding of that um, and how that might impact renters and landlords in Vermont. And then last, I guess we view, um, you know, the fact that um, the judiciary has uh, structured themselves in such a way under this emergency that um, the normal process for evictions and foreclosures, uh, you know, really can't uh, proceed as it normally would. And that would likely uh, keep um, individuals uh, in place during the shelter at home um, emergency as a practical matter. But I do recognize the chair's point about foreclosures or evictions in particular that might have been underway prior to COVID-19 um, uh, being declared uh, a pandemic and the state declaring a state of emergency. So those are just the considerations that we're taking into account. Um, I think the governor obviously is very concerned about individuals having a place to shelter during this pandemic. Um, and, um, you know, we continue as we continue to get more clarity on some of those points, um, I think um, the decision making process uh, will become more clear in the short term. Okay. So I think uh, that's code for the fact that a moratorium is still being is still under consideration by the administration at some future time if it's warranted. You can break my codes now, I guess. <laughs> 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 uh, one of the reasons I asked that is because uh, we also have Josh Hanford on and I'm trying to save some time here. And that was the question I was going to ask him, but you're both representative of the administration. So I just wanted to know that that's still being looked at. So I appreciate that. Um, okay. I appreciate your time. We're going to move on to, is, do you have anything, does anybody have any questions or do you have anything more uh, commissioner that you'd like to say? No, I think that covers it, but happy to answer questions here or offline as well. Can you, uh, when you get a better idea of what the federal law says vis-a-vis -vis, um, forbearance and foreclosure and evictions, uh, if you could send a summary along to us, that would be great. Sure, let me make a note of it. And also, Michael, any protections for landlords um, that are coming through the either the feds or the state? Absolutely. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, be well, everybody. Thank you, you too. Um, Thank you. Jed Davis, are you, have you hung in there the whole time? Uh, I am here, yeah. Hi. Uh, Hello. Jed is a CEO of the Farmhouse Group in Chittenden County, I think. I don't know if you go broader than that, but um, he's written me a couple of emails and I wanted to give him the opportunity to testify from a perspective of a restaurant owner who has leases, I guess, with landlords. So why don't you take it away, Jed? Yeah, I mean, as we all know, restaurants, small business owners are in a state of panic. And I'm really, I guess, speaking for people other than myself, although I am in a state of panic too. But um, there are people out there whose situations are more dire than mine, uh, restaurants, small business owners. Um, there was a lot of question about timing. Um, right now, there are restaurant owners that are coming to the very quick realization that they are out of cash. They're, they're, they're done. Uh, they will not have cash to reopen. Um, they will not have cash to pay rent. Uh, therefore, they will be in default of their leases. That will happen. Uh, most leases have cure periods, 10 days, 14 days. But if you're out of cash, you're out of cash. Uh, commercial leases, as you all know, are personally guaranteed, generally. Um, and there's very real concern amongst people that I interact with. Uh, a personal guarantee on a lease essentially means if you're out of business, you still owe us rent. Um, it, it can be a, uh, a, a truly a life altering financial event for someone, uh, particularly as we likely enter a climate where there's not going to be a lot of market for vacant restaurant spaces. Uh, so I can easily imagine a situation where someone's paying rent to a landlord for quite a long time. Um, I don't know the solution, um, but I do think that we just have to view this as an unacceptable outcome. 
uh, to be forced to close your business, rightfully because of a public health concern, but nonetheless to be forced to close and then just imagine continuing to pay rent uh, until, until you can't, until something happens. Um, those stories are coming in. I'm getting emails from friends that are saying, I, I got nothing left, you know, and April 1st is coming. And I just think it's, if, if nothing else, I just want to bring to all of your attention the urgency of that, of that issue. Thank, thank you, Jed. Our own constituents and businesses in our areas are, are making this very clear to us. So, um, as I understand it, uh, it's probably unlikely that um, any kind of eviction is going to start uh, or proceed uh, going forward as the court's order applies to commercial evictions as well. Um, and that at least goes uh, forward until April 15th, and I assume will be extended to the extent the COVID-19 uh, issues continue, which sounds like they will. Um, so one of the dilemmas we face, obviously, and you face it firsthand, is it's really hard to understand at this point, uh, a few arrows after, I don't even know if the bill's been signed yet, but there's a lot of pieces, moving pieces, a 600 page bill. And I just hope there's some relief for, for small businesses like your own in there. But until we get a real handle on that, it's hard to see what if any role states or municipalities might have in fixing the problem, but uh, rest assured that we're aware of it. So I thank you for, for writing and for staying in the loop. and. I, encourage you to stay in touch thank you does anybody have thank any other, you does anybody have any other questions for jed um chris you're our last witness uh but three of us have already heard from you in finance and you're getting in the way of our bathroom break so uh <laughs> and or, I, man. or lunch break I, I think we know what you're gonna say, and we thank you for the forbearance that your members are showing. And we'll probably be taking this up again next week and we can have you in then. I hope that's okay with you. Yeah, that, that'd that be great. I, I would really like to visit with the committee and give you more detailed information. Foreclosure is completely different from eviction. Right. Uh, foreclosure processes in Vermont take a heck of a lot longer. And I can assure you, we're not throwing people out on the street. So blanket moratoriums become a little bit of a challenge because we're now not able to direct resources to where they were absolutely needed. So I very much would like to meet with the committee when you take it up next week, because there is a lot more information that's happened since we last met with the finance committee. So okay. appreciate Sorry. it. Thank you. You got it. So committee. Senator Trump. Why don't we take 12 Would minutes to uh, one thirty-five? I guess, uh, Faith, are you on? Do we just hang up and die, go through the process again? Senator Soraka, did you want me to uh, try to be available again? This is uh, Commissioner Hanford. Um, you can be, well, we can hear from you now, Josh. I was basically going to try and ask you about the administration's position. I think we got that from Mike. So Sure. Well, I, I think we have some, you know, spoken directly about it quite a bit. Um, you know, that the EO is still being considered, the governor's been looking at it, um, as well as thinking about how to add in this commercial lease piece. But the legal aid proposal um, that's in the House bill, um, there, there's a few uh, concerns that we want to make sure is addressed. Uh, it's for all evictions. There's a public safety um, element to this that we've re been receiving um, issues daily from uh, someone renting a mobile home, you know, with an unsafe person that's, you know, destroying other people's property and how are they going to be evicted. So there's elements that uh, for some public safety, there may need to be 
e- evictions that proceed um, for lack of payment, that that's completely understood. So that's an item I just wanted to put on the table that should be considered as well as the language from the federal um, bill that just was approved. It's a 120 day suspension uh, of all landlords prohibiting um, initial legal action to recover pro- possession of a rental unit to charge a fee penalty or other charges related to non-payment where the landlord's mortgage on the property is insured, guaranteed, supplemented, or protected or assisted in any way by HUD, Fannie, Freddie, Rural Housing Voucher Program, or Violence Against uh, Women's Act. So there is a, a potential that there's a number of properties that will be protected by that federal issue, um, as well as the, the funding that may come through. Um, the other piece that we're concerned about is Many of these programs that come from federal funds or that even um, the house five million that's there that probably is not nearly enough. um, How those get transferred to the 80 percent of uh, rental property owners that are the smaller private um, that, you know, during this period of of not collecting rent, you know, how they filling up the oil tank or, you know, just necessary repairs, some sort of program to offer assistance, um, you know, 0% loan grants, whatever it is, um, it it needs to be developed um, to go along with the rental assistance that looks like some of that is coming in the federal relief. It probably will go out as housing vouchers, which um, that has a, a, a process through the public housing authorities and state housing authority that would need to be developed. Um, so that's sort of my, uh, high level, just, um, adding on to what you've already heard. Thank, Josh, that's very helpful. And we'll definitely will have you in uh, next week. I mean, we've gotten some emails as well uh, from neighbors of uh, tenants that are like uh, creating a nuisance or party house or things like that, that have nothing to do with non-payment of rent where uh, they, you know, in some ways are causing a, 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 um, a health issue uh, of another kind. So um, there, you know, there may need to be some flexibility built into this, though, obviously, uh, it's a balancing act. So um, we'll hear from you next week. And we'll see what the also what the House is planning on doing as to whether they're going to send something over, or we need to act first. Uh, but I appreciate your time and everybody's all the witnesses times. And if we could take 10 minutes now and be back at, let's take 13 minutes and be back at 140. And that means you got to get back on at 135 for all the time. Technical- no, you could just stay on. You could just keep it going and then move, go off and do it, whatever you're doing. Is that right? Faith told me she didn't want to do that. Fit- this is Faith. You can stay on. I'm going to shut the YouTube video down and then pick it up again when you start. So everybody else can just stay on the line. Okay. Right. So you don't have to re-sign in. Thank I'm you. Leaving.